you showed up. Bruce Knight, however, is not. Right there. So he's down there, and so as soon as I'm done, he's going to walk Oh, you guys have, like, totally worked this out and yeah. everything. How impressive! <laughs> oh, I love it! I love it! Good morning! Welcome to all of you joining us from home this morning. We are glad that you are here as well. We encourage you to use the YouTube chat function to talk to each other all throughout the service. Because I guarantee you the people in the sanctuary are going to talk to each other throughout the service too. All right. Would you stand and would you warmly greet those near you this morning? Exercise Christian hospitality to those around you this morning. Thanks for doing that. Find your seats if you would. Just a few announcements for you this morning as we get rolling. After the service today, we would invite all of you right down to the fellowship hall for Biscuit Sunday. All kinds of goodness awaits you in the fellowship hall. This coming Saturday, we have our second annual craft fair out there. <laughs> Thank you, Arva. <laughs> right out there on the front lawn. Um, what we need you to do most of all this week is promote it. So if you're on Facebook and you see the ad on Kirkwood's Facebook page, we need you to share it. Same goes with Instagram. But if you would like to post or give away flyers about the event, they are available on the Welcome Center in the foyer, and we would love for you to pick those up on your way out after the service today. Now, more on this next Sunday, but I do want to tease this you can look back at the April newsletter called The Chronicle. There's a big write-up about this. But this is the next fundraiser for our capital campaign. And the flamingos are coming. What that means is you're going to get the chance to flamingo bomb front yards everywhere or buy insurance against that happening to you. Now, I'm just going to commit to you publicly that I am personally not going to buy any insurance. So if there is flamingos on my lawn for the next month and a half, I am good with that. It will be an improvement, I assure you. <laughs> we are also going to need help with this little caper and fundraiser. We need a group of people to be what we have called the Flamingo Marauders, which should be a band name. If it is not a band name, it needs to be a band name. We need a group of people who are willing to take the flamingos to a yard and then in a few days take them down on the appropriate date. If you'd be willing to do that, you can communicate with us or next Sunday for sure you can sign up to do that. We will give you a lot more details about this next Sunday when it launches for real. With that, Let's talk about Earth Day next Sunday. For that, Christine Pregler, take a bow, chairperson of our Christian Ed Committee. <laughs> 
so this has nothing to do with Sunday school, so yay. Um, so next Sunday, we're kind of at a weird place between curriculum, so when we were brainstorming things to do, we came up with the idea that next Sunday is April, uh, Earth Day Eve, so we are going to, in lieu of the 11 o'clock Sunday school time, um, at least for my group and for the children, we're going to be having an Earth Day brunch picnic on the lawn. That means there's going to be no paper plates and utensils and cups for y'all. So bring your own stuff. So just like if you were going to a brewery or a winery or a soccer game, you bring your own stuff. Um, so bring whatever you want to eat. Charlie Reese is going to be giving you guided tours of the flora and fauna out on the prayer path and out. If some of you have seen the tree map, it is quite the thing. Um, so I will need um, a couple of volunteers to carry out the jugs of lemonade and water and to set up the three tables. So if that is you and you're willing, just let me know. Um, other than that, just come, bring some fruits and vegetables to share. Um, and let's have fun. And one more this morning from the chairperson of our worship committee, Bruce, come on up. All right, I'm under a lot of pressure from Tina here. She told me I had to up my game because last week Susie had this killer poem, so... Uh, <laughs> But I realized this morning, <laughs> I realized this morning that I'm no poet. Till today, I didn't know it. Uh -oh. Thank you. <laughs> All right, this is a participation sport. I've got three questions for you. How many like to talk with people? Raise your hand. All right. How many like coffee or tea and treats in the morning? Raise your hand. All right. Okay. What's two times two and it rhymes with four and score? <laughs> okay. It's four, okay? Um, then if you answered properly to all of those questions, then you qualify to be a greeter slash usher or work on a coffee team. And as you know, there are dozens and dozens of people every week that, that uh, work behind the scenes to make things go smoothly on Sundays. And there are two teams that uh, uh, work behind the scenes all the time uh, that I would like to get some more help with. One would be the usher teams. They're two-person teams. They get here about 30 minutes before to help open the place up, unlock doors, turn on lights, and they warmly greet people, and they help people that need seating, and in the end, they clean up and lock the doors after. And I'm looking for two teams of two. That's where the four comes in. Uh, two extra teams, and we'll, we'll assign you to the team. And that, that helps it so not the same few aren't doing the, all the work all the time. We're just trying to expand by two teams. Same thing with the coffee teams. Uh, they've done a wonderful job over the years, the same dedicated teams. It would be great to have another uh, two teams, two teams of two to help out with the coffee. And uh, again, all you do is set up and bring the treats and clean up afterwards. And if, if we get a couple extra teams, then these teams can rotate every six to eight weeks. You don't have to do it that often. So we'd really like your help. And remember this, this is very important. If you have coffee and it tastes really good, that's the week that I did the coffee. Okay? <laughs> if it tastes really bad, that's the week that Arba did the coffee. <laughs> Thank you.
think we're officially going to dub the bell choir the Flamingo Marauders. <laughs> Our first of two scripture readings this morning is a post-Easter passage from the Gospel of John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors were locked where the disciples were hiding for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus then said again to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When Jesus had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any person, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of anyone, they are retained. Let's pray for the rest of our time together this morning. Our good God, we come to you as a people who are not at peace in a country and a world that is not at peace. So here we gather to hear from you those beautiful words, be at peace. And Lord God, we know that you have sent us, your people, into the world as God sent you into the world. So we gather here together to be strengthened and encouraged in that divine mission. And most of all, we who have received your spirit want to feel its closeness, its presence, its power, and its transformation among us and in us this morning. This we lift to you together and say, Amen. Amen. Would you stand, if able, and let's sing together this morning. The second song we're going to do in this set may be new to some. We, we did it in here once, but it was a while ago. And, but if you listen to Christian radio, I'm sure you've heard Please sing along if you can. Ready? One, two, three, four. Come, come to the water, all who are thirsty, come and be filled. Come, come to the river, brothers and sisters, come and be healed, come and be healed. We believe in the kingdom come, we believe in the risen sun, you bring our hearts to life. Lord, we come with our hands up high. We believe you will satisfy, you bring our hearts to life. You bring our hearts to life. We are alive. See people returning. Mothers and fathers drawing us in. Oh, see salvation coming, Jesus our Savior, light of the world, light of the world. We believe in the kingdom come, we believe in the risen Son, you bring our hearts to life. Lord, we come with our hands up high. We believe you will satisfy. You bring our hearts to life. You bring our hearts to life. We are alive. Oh, 
Let revival come. Let the people sing the glory of your name. Let revival come. Let the people sing the glory of your name. Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name. Let the revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name, the glory of your name. Oh, we believe in a kingdom come. We believe in the risen sun. You bring our hearts to life. Lord, we come with our hands up high. We believe you will satisfy. You bring our hearts to life. You bring our hearts to life. We are alive. Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name. Let revival come, let the people sing the glory of your name, the glory of your name. Got them on my knees again. Got them begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my And walking slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you God, I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under baptize I need you Oh God, I need you Your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. 
It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water, your forgiveness It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin It's like holy water on my skin it's like holy water. Be seated. Web family, join me up front. It is our great delight this morning to celebrate together the sacrament of baptism. Because we are a beautiful big tent church full of people from all different Christian and faith backgrounds, let me explain just for a moment what baptism is. Most especially and principally, Baptism is a celebration of God's binding, unconditional promises to us. In the Bible, the word for that is covenant. It is not about our promises to God. It is about God's faithfulness to us, not about our faithfulness to Him, because we're not always faithful to Him. The Nigerian Anglican Church has a beautiful word picture for what baptism is. They say it is like being a baby whale born into the ocean. And every day of your life, you will swim surrounded by God's love and care. And you will never live a moment of your life without it. That's what we celebrate for Carson and Carter this morning. And of course, secondarily, it is about promises that we will make that Chris and Courtney, as their parents, will make. And promises that we will make to them as a family as their spiritual community. This is a celebration of God's goodness and God's commitment. It is what unifies each and every one of, this, of us. We are all God's children, and today particularly, we delight in the fact that Carson and Carter are God's beloved sons. So, Let's do some vows first. Oh, first, grandparents. We should acknowledge grandparents, shouldn't we? Beverly, thanks for being here today. And Rich and Susie, you two are part of this joyous celebration. Now, vows, parents, you guys first. There are four. I'm going to do them all in a row. Then the appropriate response is, I do. Okay? All right, here we go. Do you confess your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Do you, depending on God for his strength and grace, promise to turn away from all things that are not good, just, and loving? Do you promise to live as Christ's disciple? And do you commit to nurturing Carter and Carson in the wisdom, faith, and love of God? All right, you guys only get two. I am going to read both. The appropriate response is, we do. Depending on God for his strength and help, do you promise to be a support and aid for Chris and Courtney in their sacred parenting task? And do you promise to play your part in guiding both Carter and Carson toward their own personal commitment to God's love and his son, Jesus Christ? 
All right. It is time, fellas. You ready? Just a little bit, I promise, okay? <laughs> what you will see me do, in case you've not seen me do this before, is I'm going to draw a sign of the cross on the boy's forehead as a symbol of God's care and faithfulness to them. Ready? I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. You ready, little brother? All right, here we go. I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, guys. You did awesome. All right. Now, today is a special treat. Instead of me praying for Carter and Carson and Chris and Courtney and our faithfulness to our vows, we're going to have Granddad do it. So, Rich, take it away. Let's go in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we have just witnessed the baptism of Carter and Carson, we pray that they will grow in the faith as they learn and develop as your children. Guide them that they may always seek you in their journey. Bless Courtney and Chris, O oh Lord, strengthening them in their role as parents, guides, and nurturers. May they be a living example of faith, hope, and love. As they teach their children, may they also hold your promises, the promise of salvation, grace, and eternal life. And guide this church, O oh Lord. May we walk alongside Carter and Carson, supporting them as they grow in faith. May we be a community that lives out the gospel, embodying your grace and truth, and demonstrating to them by our actions. We pray these in Christ's holy name. Amen. Their commitment, and let's celebrate our brothers, Carter and Carson. And because baptism is primarily a celebration of God's faithfulness to us, we need to sing about that. So let's stand if able, and let's sing the greatest hymn about God's faithfulness that I know.
seated. Our second scripture reading this morning is from 2 Kings chapter 2, the first 15 verses. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty of the company of prophets also went and stood at some distance from them as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted from one side to the other, and the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. Elisha replied, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. Elijah said, You have asked a hard thing. Yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when Elisha could no longer see Elijah, he grabbed onto his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. Elisha picked up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the cloak and he struck the water. He said, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Where is he? He struck the water again and the water parted from one side to the other and Elisha crossed over. When the company of prophets who were at Jericho saw him at a distance, they declared, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. They came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. It is at this point in the service that we want to let the kids up to and including second grade head out to glory time. They can join Janine at the back of the center aisle and head out into the foyer. If you have kids here today older than second grade, over in that seating area, you will find activity bags for them at any point in the service. They are welcome to go over there and grab those activity bags. Jenny, join me up front. It is my glad privilege to introduce to you Reverend Jenny Spivey. Oh, here you go. Jenny is the senior chaplain at Westminster Canterbury on the Chesapeake over in Virginia Beach which is a full scope center uh, that has independent living, assisted living, nursing care, rehab, memory care, the whole nine yards. Um, It is Jenny and one other chaplain, right? Mm -hmm. For 700 people. So Jenny has a full slate. 
So let me tell you, this has been about six months mm -hmm. in the making. And let me explain why Jenny is here this morning. So Jenny and I really didn't know each other until about six months ago when she and I took a seminar together on Zoom. And as part of that seminar, they broke us up into duos to talk about something. And I don't remember what, but that's okay. What I do remember is that what Jenny said was so striking and insightful that when all the duos gathered back together, the facilitator asked all of us, so does anyone have anything to share from your time together? And I blurted out, <laughs> I have absolutely nothing of substance to share, but you really should ask that to Jenny. <laughs> and gladly she didn't block my email or my cell number. <laughs> um, so after that, we connected and then got together in Ward's Corner across the water for what was supposed to be an hour-long coffee that turned into about two and a half hours. Um, and from that came today. And I am delighted to share with you the wisdom that I heard six months ago. So we're going to move this through in a couple of different sections. And we're going to start with actually what she talked about six months ago that I found so striking. And that is the concept of letting go. Yes. So to rewind those six months ago, um, I, this was a webinar seminar that was offered by the Presbytery of Eastern Virginia. And the task force, it's like re church revitalization, I believe, is the name of it, task force. And they are hosting webinars, usually about quarterly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are very much focused on the lives of congregations, which is not really my life right now. I have, I have served in uh, a few congregations, um, starting out in Missouri, where I'm from, St. Louis, um, where I graduated from seminary and remained, and then in the western part of the state of Virginia, and then worked with one of our PIVA congregations in a time of transition before I went to Westminster Canterbury. So I have a love for the congregational ministry, but this webinar that was offered was, um, I don't know if, th if this was called this, but it was based on a book um, by Kenda Creasy Dean, who's out in Princeton uh, Theological Seminary, called Innovating for Love. And in this, she, she talked at the beginning of the webinar, and then we broke out into these groups. And um, I signed up for it and thought, you know, usually, although I will say, you know, caveat, but usually you don't necessarily go to a retirement community to do a lot of innovation. Um, I'll say Westminster Canterbury. <laughs> is pretty different. Um, we have a lot of leaders that are committed to doing new and innovative and creative ways of um, engaging us throughout our whole life's journey, even in that last season where it's not all about um, just quietness and rest. Um, I was laughing the other day with some older adults where when I was um, a young child being raised in the Presbyterian Church in rural North Carolina, we would go out to the local place, and it was called the Carolina Rest Home. <laughs> the people at Westminster Canterbury that I worked at laughed at that, too. Um, and it was funny because, you know, what I came to discover and what Chris and I talked about was that there really was a lot of innovation. Um, there was, you know, when we were talking about the main, the main metaphor that she used in this book, it was taken from Paul's journeys. Um, his, you know, preaching journeys that he went throughout the, the world, all to these, these churches that we still know about, that we call by their letters name, you know, Galatians, Galatia, Corinth, um, all of these, Philippi, all these places that he traveled. Um, and in one of them, he, they found that they were on a ship and the ship was going to be wrecked and they tossed everything out and they clung to the, the pieces of the ship and yet that helped them make it. Um, their ship was destroyed, but they survived, and they kept going. Um, they didn't sit there and say, well, that's ruined. Um, they found that God's spirit um, continued to, to equip them and lead them on. And um, I just found in a conversation with um, Chris that that got kind of started it off. Mm -hmm. That um, when we were talking about you know, how, how that became her metaphor, for you know, a new new places in ministry and new things to do, it was 
it was built upon a shipwreck. What had what were the the pieces that were floating and and just broken apart? Um, and I remember one thing that I shared with you then that got me thinking is she used in her um, in her work and in her talk she said you know about a shipwreck that there's two things that ha there's two names for things that happen when a ship you know that happens floatsome and jetsam. Anyone heard of these? I was like, I feel like that's pretty good in a you know maritime community that we would you know those would be words that. And what was so cool was that at Westminster Canterbury, we have, we have a little mm, resident run group and they don't use their full name very much. They call themselves F and J, but it stands for Floatsam and Jetsam. And what they do is they coordinate to help people that are moving in because usually they got too much stuff. There is no way that all the stuff that they've been accumulating in their homes for 40, 50 years sometimes is going to fit in an apartment, in a high rise. We're a, we're a high rise. And um, so the process of downsizing, of letting go, is a hard one for a lot of people. And yet, it's freeing for so many people when they find that they've made that change and come. And then also, they take. And the end of one's journey, when someone passes on and a family cannot keep all of the things, again, they come back to the community and they are organized and handed on some things to some of the local ministries in Virginia Beach that need them, particularly Union Mission we partner with. Um, but also then they, they run a little like store and the money that they sell, the money that they get from these things that we can't use, that other people will, will use, residents or guests or families, go to our foundation. And it, it just seemed to me, it was like that's the idea that she was saying of letting go. And um, to be in a place where we, a ministry where we have to let go all the time. Um, we're letting go of things that are old and we cannot use anymore, um, but discovering that through that, that process of letting go, of change, of that there's, there's something new that God is bringing into our lives. And I think that's particularly an Easter, mm -hmm. an Easter message. It's a resurrection message. So obviously, Jenny's memory is way better than mine. <laughs> and what's really funny, I publicly confess, is I sit on the committee that plans those seminars, and I do not remember what it was about. <laughs> <laughs> so similarly, talk to us about how you've observed the need for there to be a passing mm -hmm. of the leadership baton, baton between generations. Yeah. Um, so I as talking to Chris and telling him about the ministry at Westminster Canterbury, I've been there for nine and a half years. And that's a lot of passage of time, really. Um, we have, you know, it, it averages out, though it never works very averagely, that we have about 50 deaths a year. So that's about one a week. But they never do that. They decide to do like seven at a time. and. Uh, <laughs> But to, to think about the, the continual cycle of those who have come and lived their life and, and go on um, into God's kingdom, that we always are then welcoming new people. The span of ages of people at Westminster Canterbury is from 62 to 104. <laughs> Um, that's like the span of ages if I had a baby today and me. Like that's, I mean, we have people whose children are living there. Um, and that's a really cool thing. We have what's called, le you know, like they apply and they go through the process, but we have legacy. We have people whose parents lived there and, and died and the leader decided to come. Um, but not only in families, it's the generations passing one thing down to another, which was one reason um, when, when we were brainstorming and thinking about the themes for today, my mind went to the passage of Elijah and Elisha. And if you count how many times, it was a very repetitive passage, and that's really, the, the, most of these passages, not everyone could read. I mean, you couldn't like mass produce scrolls that took a long time. And so they would be read to you, and when you hear it, time over time, three times, that rule of threes, that 
Elisha was reminded, you know, that it was like, I'm going to go. I'm not leaving you. Nope, take me with you. I'm not ready for this yet. Um, and he stayed, and he stayed, and he agonized um, until finally there was this passing. Um, you know, more of a mantle than a baton, but same idea. I don't, we don't really pass mantles so much anymore, but we do pass batons um, where you run for a while, and then you hand it on to someone. Um, and I, that, it has to happen. Um, and where I am, I think it's amazing because as soon as you become a part of the community, not only are you practicing hospitality, we have a whole welcome committee, um, but you know what they realize is it's better for the people who've just been welcomed and who are there to welcome the next group. So we have new residents welcoming the residents. Then about after a year, the welcomed residents that have been there for a little bit, they take the leadership to welcome the next ones because they know what it's like. They've just been there. They've moved in, and they've been there for a little while. And so they're the ones that take it next. And I can see this throughout. Um, it's an extremely active community. And how amazing it is that people know when to say, oh, I can set this down now. Um, one thing I've learned from them is they've, you know, as many of you too, um, I know many of you would probably fall, I'm not going to ask you how old you are, but will probably fall within the ages of 62 to 104. Probably not too many towards the 104 end of the range. Um, but sometimes it's hard. It's um, having a mother who went through retirement a few years ago, hearing for in a different way what it's like to let go of something that's defined your life for so many years and to discover what God is calling her to now, what God calls us to now, and that they do that with courage mm -hmm. and trust. And they can say, I, I'm done with that. And, and what's next? Um, and some programs that were going strong when I got there um, changed. They decided that wasn't the best way to do them anymore. And, now there's new things. One of the coolest new things that happened since I've been there, it's because God brings different gifts together, just like Paul says. We now have a Sunday, Sunday evening jam session. It's not a churchy thing. Um, a Sunday evening jam session where four guys got together, um, most of them kind of newer move-ins that could play the guitar, could play the drums, got a harmonica in there somewhere. And like everyone loved them so much, they're like, please play every Sunday evening next to our dinner place. And they, it's just amazing. And you know what we did after that is we were like, these guys are really good. I wonder if they'd play the guitar in our service. <laughs> we're still working on it, but we got there. We got, we got some, it's like guest status right now. We're like guest guitar anthem today. Um, because I think what's wonderful is that people can come and we discover their gifts and who they are and they become a f part of the fabric of what we do. And, it's wonderful to be able to explore the new gifts that God brings us and to incorporate them into the life of our whole community, um, but also into the ministry that's a part of the community in so many ways. So when we got together for this sprawling, wide-ranging conversation in Norfolk, at some point, we landed on the subject of death. And she got a twinkle in her eye and said to me, so you really want to go there? And I got a twinkle in my eye and said, oh, you bet. So um, share with us about managing death, but more how our culture often misconceives death or mismanages it. Mm -hmm. Well, and just to start with that, um, the mismanaged side a little bit is to say that one of the ways we mismanage it is that we don't talk about it. Um, that it becomes something that, um, you know, in some ways is hidden or, or put away, put aside. Um, it, it evokes, in even the healthy of us, some fear, um, some concern, some, the sense of loss, and to have the conversations about what the arrangements might look like. Um, it's, it's hard to, to face that um, and to look at that with that, that sense of finality that's there. 
Um, and so in that, um, I, my, some of my colleagues who have, who have been um, parts of continuing education for me joke that I'm this like forever existentialist, so I like to talk about death. Um, and I found the most curious ally in this um, recently, so last summer. Um, I, I admit that when I heard there was a Barbie movie coming out, I was like, okay, so I was of the generation that had Barbies. Um, my mom was not, she, she was pre-Barbie. Um, her, her younger sisters, that was when Barbie kind of started happening, um, but she never played with them. And, but we and my sister, two of us, we were Barbie girls, but I was like, I wasn't a Barbie girl. You know, it's like we played with them, but like, if you saw the movie, did any of you see the movie, the Barbie movie? Okay, did you see the weird Barbie? That's what my Barbies ended up looking like, <laughs> because I was like, we need to try some hairstyles here. Um, you know, like I just was, so I, again, I was like, I, I don't know what this is gonna be. And then I started hearing some of the reviews and was like, okay, okay, we'll try that. So, of course, my sister, um, who does not live um, here in town, she came into town and the three of us, my mom, my sister, and I, went to the movie. And, you know, it starts off normal enough, you know, Barbie world, everything's pink, everything's perfect. Um, women are empowered. It's, you know, um, it's, it's really, it was very funny, very um, thought-provoking. Thought um, so if you've seen the movie, you know, you're meeting the whole world. Everyone's name's Barbie, by the way, so that's, that's confusing. Um, but there's lots of them. Um, so again, they're like, hi, Barbie, hi, Barbie, hi, Barbie. And then there's Ken, um, and then there's Alan, too. That's weird. And um, <laughs> it was just, just very, very funny. Um, but, you know, they're just having this amazing time, just, just wonderful. And they're having this dance party. And, of course, the, the main character is stereotypical Barbie, the blonde. Um, Barbie, and she's the main character. She's in the middle of this huge dance scene, and all of a sudden she stops, and she's like, hey, you guys ever think about dying? <laughs> now, I think I, my mom and I, my sister probably too, but my mom and I particularly um, burst out in laughing <laughs> when that line was delivered. I, I don't know that anyone else in the theater had that reaction. <laughs> <laughs> They're like... That's not, that's not funny. Um, we're like, no, it's really funny because we don't talk about this. And yet there was some chord that was struck in me that actually it's in sometimes our most exciting, joyful moments that we're like, this isn't going to last forever. Uh-oh. Is this all that there is? Um, and, and that's the beginning of this journey, this odyssey that, that Barbie goes on. And it's kind of a, um, you know, it's this awakening to what is there to life, but also what is there that is the mystery of life and death. Um, this came to me when I was just sitting down there um, because it's one of, my, one of my favorite passages of scripture. And I mean, again, in Easter, we talk about death and life and the astonishing thing about Jesus is that he was not afraid of talking about death. In fact, he had Peter and his other disciples around him. He's like, hey, guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Peter's like, no way. Nope, nope, I don't want you to hear talk about this. We're not, we're not talking about this. We're not talking about this. Jesus is not going to happen. And Jesus is like, Peter. And so they didn't want to talk about it. They, they didn't deal with it too well at first. Honestly, even the passage that we heard earlier uh, at it's the it's Easter evening in John 20, they are locked away in a room. They're scared. And yet even into that space, Jesus comes into a space of just death where they they were not imagining anything else yet. Jesus comes alive. Um, and it reminded me of baptism. For as much as we're like, this is amazing new life that's happening, this promise and this hope, um, Paul reminds us that they belong together, and it's a poignant one that's read, um, and often can be read at funerals from uh, the sixth chapter of Romans, where Paul says, do you not know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus are baptized into his death? And he doesn't stop there, but that's where you start. And for churches that practice an immersion baptism, 
That's the whole idea of going under the water, is it's like you are dying. And then you rise up. It's a beautiful image. And we can keep practicing that in ways that use various amounts of water, as we did today. But Paul goes on to say, the old life is gone. And a new life begins. And that that doesn't just happen for us. I think we often are like, yep, right, we're going to die, then we're going to have that new life in heaven. I think Paul's like, no, no, that happens right here. That has to happen to us all the time. And that can happen when there's loss and change of any kind um, in any moment. And I think that that's in a being in a place where we do not only talk about death, but we know death. We know the people who are dying, and, and for those who are there, and even being at a younger age, you know, we live as those prepared to die. And I think that's the way that we, I mean, manage death. You know, it's hard, because we don't really have any control over it. I mean, like, manage, is, is, in the end, I think we do. But that, that's how we faithfully face, talk about, and live as people of the cross, um, that, that that's a part of it. Um, we, we love the new life part. And that's there. Um, but it comes through the death of Jesus, um, that, that we, we, we sit there. We are there, um, just as we did. Um, I don't know how y'all observed Holy Week, but that's important to be there so that we know that the new life is going to come. So let's finish with one more thing. I'm going to squeeze together the last two things gotcha. you and I emailed about. Right. So talk to us out of your own expertise and your own experience about the relationship between grief, loss, and change. And you can even give us very practical pointers, uh, like for those who are experiencing loss or who are grieving. Or you can tell us as a church things to do or not do for those who are experiencing mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as we talked and, and kind of getting all the things here together, um, one of the other points as you're saying that we kind of tossed in there that we're going to do is, is that it's something that we, we do together. Um, one thing I, I experience as I um, am in the midst of times of, of illness, um, times of um, really the, the end of life situations, um, as I am with families in the moments of death and right after, um, the, the loss and the change, I think it can feel like, you know, it's absolutely life changing, and it is, but that it can feel very isolating. Um, and that we don't do this alone. Um, I think one of the, the lessons we can learn from the disciples who scattered and went off on their own and, and were very scared is they finally got back together, at least. That's good. Um, but that sometimes we try to face that on our own. It feels like no one might understand. Um, and one of the important things that, that we do, um, we, we connect people with one another. So as, as Chris was saying, um, there are two chaplains. Um, I've been there for about nine and a half years, and um, I'm most recently working with another chaplain who's been there for about two and a half years. We make a great team, um, and it's, it's great. But we, the two of us, do not do all the pastoral care. We can't. Um, we want we be there. But I think that's the, the, the thing that we look at and that I think that's great for our church is that actually all of us in our baptism are called to live out the ministry of Christ. And we do it in different ways with different gifts, and we care for one another. A um, couple of tangible ways that takes, that materializes, is we have a grief and loss support group that meets on a regular basis. And you know, it's, it can be scary, as I, as I have heard people say, to walk in that room for the first time. And yet each time I see someone come for the first time, usually I know why they're there. Sometimes I don't, because sometimes they may have lost someone that I don't know about. Um, but it's this holy moment where people come to open up their hearts and souls that are hurting and to connect with the love that's around them. And it's, um, 
uh, Henri Nouwen wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. And it's like that. It's, um, you know, we don't have to be like, I have all the answers for you <laughs> to help you. No, we reach out to one another even in our brokenness and in our own senses of loss. And that's what really powerfully connects people to one another. We have a group of people who are walking together towards a lot of end of life things for caregivers and the difficult times that they face that we don't face those alone. Um, that, that really we can trust that this is the promise of Jesus. Um, and I was just hearing this again as, as we read the scriptures this morning where it was, it's funny that the shift that we can, I invite you to hear is that Elisha said to Elijah, you know, Elijah's like, here, I've gotta, I gotta go here. He's like wrapping up all the stuff. He's gotta go here, I gotta go to the Jordan. And Elisha's like, I will not leave you. And Elisha saying that, I will not leave you. It's like, I just imagine like Elijah trying to drop off Elisha at, at college and it going like really bad. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I remember when my parents drove away from me, I was William and Mary. Um, and I remember watching, standing in front of my freshman dorm and watching the car just get smaller and smaller. And I was like, oh no, oh no. Um, <laughs> that was really real. And like Elisha would have been like running after the car. Like he would have been like, nope, nope. Um, but that was this, the sense of wanting to grasp onto something and that fear that even when he finally did let go and the mantle was passed, God's spirit rested on him. Um, but... You know, you know, when I heard, heard that repeated those three times this morning, you know who really said that to us? Was Jesus. Jesus said that. But Jesus meant it in a very different way. Jesus said, I will not leave you. And so wherever we are now, just as he came to his disciples, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. That Jesus is with us. Um, and that what can we do that if we're showing up with someone that might be you know, facing the, the first moments of loss, the shock, the, you know, the, the, all of the things that you might associate with that, denial, anger, you know, just all of this stuff that happens in that immediate grief time, that how can we communicate in our words and just in our presence what Jesus said, I will not leave you, I will be with you always. So I think the best way to respond this morning at least initially, is by praying. So I want us to be quiet for a moment or two. And I think you need to pray. And you need to pray about yourself and what you heard this morning that struck a chord about your own life, like maybe letting go or passing the baton or who knows what. But then I want you to pray for the other people you know in your life or in our church who are perhaps grieving or going through loss or maybe who need you to care for them. So take a minute in the quiet and just offer up your personal prayer for yourself and for others. And after a moment or two of that, I'm going to pray aloud and I'm going to pray for Jenny. Faithful God, I thank you this morning for the gift of Jenny's wisdom and experience that she so readily shared with us. I pray, Lord, that what she said does not soon leave us, because letting go, regardless of age, is hard for all of us. Sharing responsibility and leadership with others is hard for all of us, regardless of age. 
loss of any kind is hard for us, regardless of age. Thank you for what she does. Thank you for the many lives she touches. Give her and her colleague great strength and joy as they go about their chaplaincy role. I pray that she is blessed in her life every bit as much as she blesses other people. And I pray that you surround her with people who will encourage her and offer their gratitude to her for all that she does and the sacrifices she makes. God, we thank you together this morning in the name of Jesus, our Lord, Savior, and peace. Amen. Amen. We are going to finish our time of prayer by praying together the Lord's Prayer. This is a version that comes from a book of liturgy written uh, with and among uh, people from all over the world who are in marginalized or poor communities called Liturgies from Below. So I'm going to play the role of leader. When we get to the next slide, you'll see yellow font. That will be for you, and we're going to pray this through together. You can do the congregation part when we get there. Okay? Ready? Let's pray. Our God and holy elder who colors the earth and sky, be blessed because of all you give us. You are our light, our life, and our love. May all goodness and justice come to all of your sons and daughters. And to this sacred end, we commit our energy, our attention, and the whole of our lives. May your many resources be shared with equity so that there is no lack of bread on any table. We need to be forgiven far more than we take and we need to offer forgiveness far more than, than we actually do. For without grace piled upon grace, life and love collapse into chaos. Keep us far from the temptations that entice us, like greed, pride, power, and fear. For the strength of their evil far exceeds the measure of our resolve. We ask all these things because you alone possess the memory of the Creator. You alone know the depth of our world struggle, and you alone are the hope of any good future. Amen. Would you please thank Jenny for coming here this morning? All right, would you stand, if able, and let's sing together the next song. You can come over here with me.
Thank you so much for being here with us. As you leave today, we would love for you to stop by the Welcome Center, meet somebody. We've got a gift for you for being here today. If you're online catching us for the first time, reach out to us via email. Our church email is in the video description. We would also love to connect with you. Remember, grab flyers for the craft fair from the Welcome Center in the foyer. Also, head to the fellowship hall directly after the service is done for Biscuit Sunday. Also, Jenny's going to be there for a while so you can come and talk to her one-on-one. -on -one, and we are thankful that she is willing to stick around to answer your questions, talk to her more, because she shared lots of great stuff this morning. And for the benediction today, Jenny, come and offer that. Friends, go in peace, for as Jesus has said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. So friends, go knowing that the Holy Spirit rests upon you, and may the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. You can consider yourself dismissed after our final song. Ready? One, two, three, four. You are not alone if you are lonely. When you feel afraid, you're not the only. We are not a thing in need of mercy. To be forgiven and be free. It's all you've got to lean on, but thank God it's all you need. And all the people said amen. Oh, oh, oh. and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. If you're rich or poor, well, it don't matter, weak or strong, you know, love is what we're after. We're all broken, but we're all in this together. God knows we stumble and fall. And he so loved the world, he sent his son to give us all. And all the people said amen. Oh, oh. Thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. Blessed are the poor in spirit who are torn apart. Blessed are the persecuted and the pure in heart. Blessed are the people hungry for another star. For theirs is the kingdom, the kingdom of God. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen. And all the people said amen. Whoa, and all the people said amen. Give thanks to the Lord for his love never ends. And all the people said amen and all the people said amen